Well, hey there. In this episode of the Intentional Mom Podcast, it is one of our guest speaker episodes, and I'm excited not only because it's a guest speaker episode, which are always among our most popular episodes, but because this is such a popular thing to be talking about right now. Uh, It is spring, summer is right around the corner, we're getting outside, and we're going to be talking with Shelby DeVore about all things gardening and even a little bit of homesteading made easy for beginners. Believe me, I've got a brown thumb, and if Shelby can make somebody who can grow something out of me, well, there is hope for every single person. So I'm excited to share this episode with you. This is something that, uh, this is from a conversation that I had with Shelby for our Simplify Your Summer online summit back in 2023, but it is perfectly timed for this time of the year. So we're going to jump in and talk about all the basics about gardening, a a little bit of uh, homesteading, think sourdough starter. That's all the rage right now. So I'm excited to share this episode with you. Let's jump in. Well, hey there, I am Jennifer Roskamp, a certified life coach and homeschool mom of nine who is passionate about helping women just like you embrace the here and now while also being focused on creating the life you actually want. In reality, it's not about thinking life will get so much better or so much easier when you fill in the blank. Let's work on creating a life you love now. So let's dive in and get started on redefining Supermom to be someone who is present, intentional, and content rather than perfect in our homes, in our lives, and in our own skin. Let's get started. This is the Intentional Mom Podcast. I am so excited to introduce you to our next guest today. This is Shelby DeVore, and she is a multi-generational homesteader with 20 plus years of experience growing and producing her own food. She has extensive experience in all things agriculture. Not only has she lived this lifestyle, but she also has both a bachelor's degree in animal and dairy science and a master's degree in agriculture. Wow, that's like amazing. So um, she spent six and a half years teaching high school and college agricultural classes before starting her online business where she teaches women how to embrace a simpler, more traditional life. So welcome, Shelby. Thank you so much for being here with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I am super excited about this. Yeah. So I am, this is so something I want to learn about, but it is so something that I know nothing, next to nothing about. So I am so excited that you are here. Can you tell us, like you've been doing this for a long time, but can you kind of just highlight maybe the the main points of how you got into being more self-sufficient and the whole idea of homesteading. You know, to me, this feels like such a huge thing that I could never figure out for you, you know, because you came into it, like it probably just by default was a little bit, not so intimidating, but like, yeah, just if you can highlight a little bit about your journey, that might make someone like me, who's kind of like an outsider, a little bit less intimidated. That look, I hear that all of the time. And it always makes me laugh because I think The issue is when, when you hear the word homesteading, you almost go back into like this little house on the prairie, making everything from scratch, like doing everything completely handmade, right? And that's not actually how it has to work. Um, It doesn't have to be that complicated. Like, don't forget what century we're in. (laughs) Like we have a lot of modern technology that can make things so much simpler. Even if you want to like go all in, it doesn't have to consume your entire life. Right. So I actually grew up on a small homestead. And what's funny is I thought that everybody lived like that because I'm from an extremely rural area in Tennessee most people have chickens, they have a huge garden, they're canning all summer long. Like that's just how things are done. It wasn't until I went to college and turned my apartment balcony into a mini garden and people would like stop and ask questions that I was like, oh, maybe most people don't know how to do this kind of stuff, right? (laughs) Because um, you're asking the question, what is happening here? <laughs> I remember um, we had tomato plants on our balcony and somebody 
our apartment at the time was right next to a volleyball court and some guys were out there playing volleyball and uh, one of them walked by and we were outside on the balcony and he goes, what is that? And he pointed at our tomato plants. And we're like, yeah. tomatoes? And he was like, no way, you can grow tomatoes? Like, and I thought, yeah. <laughs> Like, it just seemed so silly to me, but I do think yeah. from talking and teaching people this for so long that that's kind of the vision they have is little house on the prairie and they instantly get intimidated and they're like, I don't know how to do any of this stuff. And it does not have to be that complicated. I will say that's a little bit of what I have in my head, right? Like I, I think a little bit like I'm not at all like Caroline, like that is not me. So, but yeah. I, I would love, you know, it's always been something that has been so intriguing. So like for someone like me who might, I, I will confess, I have a brown thumb. Like I got it in the family. Like all of my, my sisters, my mom is an amazing everything, right? We're not homesteaders, but like like she can do all the things, both of my sisters, it just skipped me entirely. So are there certain things that challenged people like me can start growing or working with that are like easier to start that will allow us to feed our families, right? Like that's my purpose. I want to help. Obviously I have a huge family, right? Like, yeah, that will help me feed my family stuff. They will actually eat without me feeling like, oh my gosh, I have to like be a master gardener. Yeah. Um, Totally. So first of all, I don't believe you when you say that you have a brown thumb <laughs> because I don't think that there is such thing. Oh. So you may have just become victim to like bad information or just simply not having the information that you need to be successful. Um, that is probably it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So once I've like most people, once they find they have just the basic information they need, um, instantly they have a green thumb. So that's that's there's probably all that is. Is that what you're yeah. saying? There's, there is, there's definitely hope for you, yeah. Um, with that being said, certain things are easier to grow and produce than other things, right? Um, and I think it's kind of a personal preference as far as which way you go, because if we're being honest, the world of homesteading is huge as far as what you can do. You could get into so many different things, right? Like it, maybe your thing is making cheese. Maybe it's gardening. It maybe it's chickens, you know, like you can go so many different directions. Yeah. So what I like to tell people to do is go through what we call the five minute refrigerator and pantry challenge. Super simple process. All you need to do is set a timer on your phone, grab a notepad and a pen, set your timer for five minutes. I want you to go through your refrigerator, go through your pantry, or if you have a grocery list, right, for this week, you All can grab time. your grocery list. I know. <laughs> Never we, empty. I know. I know how you feel. Um, so those are the three things that you can look at and you can focus on. And what I want you to do as you're going through this, this challenge is focus on what you're purchasing every single week, okay? So for our family, we go through a lot of fresh garlic. We go through onions each week. To, we're using some type of tomato each week, and we use lettuce each week. Those four things are always on our grocery list if we're not producing them at home. So for us, that makes sense. If we're limited in time or space or a budget, like if I'm not going to focus on anything else, it needs to be those four things, right? And that also kind of limits you as to what all you're trying to do so that you can get really good at growing those tomatoes that your family eats or the lettuce or the garlic, you know, whatever it is for you, it gives you the time to really master those skills. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I love the idea of, I mean, that's so simple, right. To look at what, cause that's always my thing is like, I feel like, I feel like there's things 
that I'm supposed to grow like, right. But like, what if none of my kids will eat that? Right. And, and I mean, I do have, you know, out of my eight kids who still live at home. I mean, I obviously do have some of my kids who are, are, uh, more, what you would say more pickier eaters than others. So, so we, we need to start and set the five minute timer and just kind of write down those things, three, those five, three to five things, maybe, um, is there a way to start small when we think about becoming self-sufficient? Like, do we need a lot of land? Do you need a lot of space? Like, and do you recommend just kind of like when, when we were to list those things, would we start like, if we noticed that maybe three of those things are things we would grow, would you tell us to focus there? Or what if like we had things that like spanned multiple categories? Like, again, if you're just starting, do you want to just kind of stick to one general area? I don't know. Yeah. So this is kind of where it gets a little bit into personal preference, right? So some people actually feel more comfortable with livestock than they do with a garden, right? We hear from people all the time. I have a brown thumb. I kill everything. You know, I want to start with chickens and do that. In that instance, it makes sense. Um, if you're going to start with livestock chickens, we recommend that for everybody as like the go-to beginner because they're super simple. They don't take up a lot of space. They, they're pretty much hands-off once they're grown. You're just, you know, doing things for maintenance for them. Um, but if you're completely new and you don't have a clue where to start, I would say start with a garden. And the reason for that is it's a lot less risk, especially emotional risk, right? So if you- That's a that cool thing to call out. Like that's true. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just put it in perspective. So let's say you, you go and you buy five baby chicks and your kids are playing with them. They get really attached to them. Um, because that's what kids do with baby chicks. They love to hold them and play with them. Um, we have baby chicks in our house right now and they're, that's my youngest, like she just carries them around everywhere. So with an animal, there's that emotional attachment, right? There's the same learning curve with an animal as it is with a garden, mm. much more emotional attachment. So if something happens, and it gets sick and dies or whatever, that's going to feel a lot harder yeah. than if you buy five tomato plants and they die and you never get a tomato out of them. You know, it's kind of yeah. like, eh, right. we'll, we'll get some more and try again. Not a big deal. Yeah, I have much um, more of a try again attitude when I think about a tomato plant than... Yeah. 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 Huh. That's yeah. I never would have thought about that, but man, is that so true? Like, I'm just like, huh, that is, that is a really good thought. So one of my big questions when I think about this again, as an outsider is like, what is the time investment going to be? Like, that's like to learn just some of the basics, you know, let's just say if we start with gardening, like what, what kind of time is there to be invested? What are some of the basic supplies? And maybe even like, what is like the monetary investment here, you know? Yeah. So I always recommend start very small. And the reason for that is there is a term in our industry that we use. It's called homesteading burnout. And it is such a real thing. I see people deal with it all of the time. And what happens is people decide this is the lifestyle I want. And they, again, kind of have that little house on the prairie vision of everything. They want a big garden. They want to be making bread from scratch. They want a milk cow and chickens and all of the things, right? They want, they want all of the things. And so they dive in head first and they put a big garden in the ground Somebody gives them goats, they go out and buy chickens, then they they figure out they've got like their plate is way too full. Yeah. But now they're already in it. So right. they just kind of keep trudging along. And a lot of those people eventually they get to a breaking point and they're like, this is too much. I can't do this. 
I'm done. Yeah. So to avoid that, we always tell people to start small because you have to think about the fact that it doesn't matter what you try to do on your homestead, there's going to be a learning curve. So if you're trying to bake sourdough bread, more than likely the first time that you put a loaf into the oven, it is not going to come out and look like sourdough bread. <laughs> um, same thing with your livestock, right? There's a learning curve for that. There's a learning curve for your garden. And you want to make sure that you're giving yourself enough time and patience and grace to make mistakes and figure out what you're actually doing. Um, so you can do this on an extremely busy schedule. We are actually proof of this. So I run a really busy business. I've got people that I manage. Um, my kids play competitive sports all year long. So we're going, going, going. We're very active in our church. Um, we may have like one day a week where we don't have commitments when the kids get home from school. You know, like it's, we're constantly doing things. Um, and we still manage to have a big garden, can a bunch of food, have livestock, but we've kind of gradually built all of this into our schedule. And I like to, I hate to say do things the lazy way because I want to make sure that they're still getting done right. right. But that's one of the benefits of homesteading today that people, you know, two or 300 years ago, they had to do everything manually. We don't really have to do that anymore. We've got stuff we can take advantage of to kind of help us with that. Um, yeah. And then as far as supplies that you need to get started, you can start with like super minimal supplies. Okay. So if you're wanting to garden, um, you could till up a small plot in your backyard and just amend the soil, like add compost to it and have a really successful garden. Mm. And that's, I mean, that's, that's not a lot of commitment as far as stuff that you're purchasing, right? right? Maybe a few bags of compost, maybe some plants to get started. Um, livestock is a little bit different because right. you do have to provide, you know, shelter and feed that kind of thing. Again, that's another reason that we typically recommend people start with a garden because yeah. just all around it's less commitment. Um, yeah. Supplies, time, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, hearing you talk about you know, like even sourdough bread and that kind of thing, like that's, that's an even smaller commitment, at least in my mind. So like where, what kind of supplies do you need for that sort of thing? Like I, I've made regular bread back in the day, but like, just to get a, like, what do we need? Like, like for a sourdough bread, like I wouldn't even know what I would need for that. Like even to just think on those terms, what sorts of supply that would certainly be if I were to do kind of like my challenge, I would say bread items would certainly probably be on that list, if not on that top five, for sure, within the top seven. So what would we need to do that sort of thing? Like just be in the kitchen, maybe like the baking route, maybe that sort of thing. What would that look like so from a supply, from a supply standpoint? Yeah. So again, we're, I mean, you're talking about minimal stuff that you would need. Um, if you were doing regular bread, like your basic stuff, uh, flour, sometimes eggs, milk, depends on what type of bread you're making with that. Sourdough is a little bit different, right? Because it is a fermented bread. So you have to have a sourdough starter to get started. But it's really easy to find and it's very cheap. And it's one of those things that you purchase it one time and you get it started or activated, right? And you feed it like once yeah. a week and it just produces more and more. So if you keep it alive, you just buy the one starter. And I purchased some, um, one of our local stores sells dehydrated sourdough starter and it's, it's shelf stable, right? Because it's dehydrated. Yeah. Yeah. I think I paid like six bucks for it. So mm -hmm super that cheap kind of um, like that feels like oh okay I can 
Maybe, yeah. You know, like yeah. I can manage and that. I will say, I will say, even if you completely fail with your bread attempts, which most people do at first, you still end up with mostly an edible product. Unless yeah, you just, it might just look not right or it might not rise right or something right. Yeah. Like kind of a thing where it just like the consistency might be a little bit off or right. right when I think about it not working, I guess that's what comes to my mind is it won't rise or maybe it will be too dense or. Yeah. Yeah. It won't, it's not going to be perfect the first time yeah. you do it, but you're still going to end up with some sort of some thing that you can use. It's going to be edible. Um, yeah. So it's not like, you know, if your tomato plants die, like they're completely gone. It's a lost cause. Um, sourdough yeah. isn't something that's super intimidating. Should, we shouldn't feel super intimidated by like a sourdough. No, no. Um, it's just a different type of bread. That's, yeah. that's what I want you to get in your mind. We're yeah. using a fermented bread and it's so much better for you. Did you know, like that fermented bread, your body digest it completely differently than it does oh. regular bread? No, I had mm -hmm. no idea. Yeah. So huh. regular bread is really hard on your digestive system. Yeah. Sourdough bread is completely the opposite. It's got a lot of good stuff that like nourishes your digestive system's microbiome. So it's amazing. Right. Um, huh. And it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of time, right? So right. if you're you're doing sourdough, we're talking maybe two or three minutes a day. And then the day that you bake, you've got like five minutes of prep time and then your bake time. Like it's not a big deal. I think I could even manage that, <laughs> you know, from a time standpoint, for sure. What about like growing? So when I think about things that I've grown at times, are there like, I definitely get that we want to make sure we're growing stuff that, um, that we will use. So when I think again about my, my list would look very similar to yours, lettuces, tomatoes, for sure. I have, I have, I will say successfully grown tomatoes and I have successfully grown like zucchini type stuff. Um, I feel like those are pretty hardy. Are there an easy for most, like if I, I feel like if I can do that, without great information, they must be pretty much not that difficult. Are there some things that you would direct us towards or point us to that maybe are a little bit easier from a growing standpoint to maybe look into starting again with the understanding that we want to make sure that our families will eat it, but are there some things that are just more beginner friendly to grow? Yeah. So I want to point out real quick, you said earlier that you have a brown thumb. If you have successfully grown a tomato plant, that means you do not have a brown thumb. Do you know how many people have problems with tomato plants? Really? I answer questions like weekly about people's tomato plant problems. Well, so, I, guess, I guess it was, thank you for letting me know that that was like, I didn't even know that that was an accomplishment. Like, yeah. I guess so, I just got lucky there. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that they, here's what I do know about tomatoes, at least from my experience, again, seems like they are a little bit finicky in terms of weather. Like if they get too dry or if they get too wet, like they seem a little yeah. bit that way. But for the most part, I didn't mess that up usually. No, if you got tomatoes off of them, I would say that was an accomplishment. So um, usually if you are completely new to gardening, you should also take into consideration that some things take longer to produce than other things. So for example, with a tomato, usually if you're planting a, you put a plant in the ground, so you're not starting from seeds, you right. go to the nursery and you buy a plant, you're still talking about a couple of months before you get anything off of that. So that's a really long time to feel like you're taking care of something and not get something in return, right? Yeah. So um, Patient. one of the, yeah, one of the faster routes that you can take, and it they tend to be a little bit less finicky than like tomatoes, are lettuces and leafy greens, like your spinach, your kale, mustard greens. Um, a lot of those are ready to harvest in about a month. 
And that's like starting them from seeds Mm. to harvest. So if you're putting plants in the ground, you can shorten that even a couple of weeks, but they have a lot less nutrient requirements than like your fruiting plants, like a tomato would. So they feel a lot easier to take care of and they finish faster. So that just makes it seem a little bit easier. Yeah. And I would imagine just kind of springing off that, I would imagine that obviously where you live plays into account, uh, you know, in terms of how many harvests or whatever, like I think of you in Tennessee, well, I live in Michigan. So, I mean, my growing season is going to look different from yours, I would imagine, right? Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. So you're going to have a lot shorter growing season in the summer, which is going to determine which types of, especially crops that have a longer growing period, like tomatoes, um, it's yeah. really going to determine which varieties are going to work well for you. Yeah. So I am originally from Tennessee. We moved to Texas a couple of years ago. And oh, okay. Got it. Again, yeah. Again, completely different growing seasons. So in Tennessee, we could grow a summer garden from, I would say like mid April into October. Well, here in Texas, we get ridiculously hot in July and August. So we actually have two growing seasons and our off season is July and August, which is weird because most of the country, they're still growing, you know? Yeah. 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 That's, that's such a good thing to keep in mind too. Like I never even thought about, but about that, but that, that is so true that you have to take or different areas of the country or even the world would have to take breaks for heat. Whereas like that, that doesn't happen in our world here. That's not to say that we won't get hot, super hot weather. Um, and then sometimes I know it will affect things like, obviously then that means you're having to water more and stuff like that when, you know, when more is being taken out. So, so yeah. Well, if you were going to leave us with one quick take action now tip for us, like if we're like, yes, I want to just, I like the idea of being more self-sufficient aside from like doing that challenge, you know, going through and listing our five things. Like I, I totally get that. I think that's a super place, smart place to start, but anything else you would add to that? Something that again, feels like minimal commitment. Like I can do this type thing. Yeah. So I would just encourage people, once you go through that five minute challenge, pick out, you know, what your top, maybe three to five priorities would be. And then don't overthink it. I know so many people, they, they're like, well, I have no idea what I'm doing. I need to learn how to do this before I get started. And they end up in analysis paralysis and they don't actually start. And next thing you know, the growing season has come and gone and you're like, well, didn't do that again. So I would say start, even if you have to start, even if it's with something really small, like one tomato plant or trying to learn how to bake sourdough bread, pick your one thing and start. Yeah. It's almost like just taking the stigma out of your own almost your own label, like admittedly that I put on myself, like I can't grow stuff. Like I could never do this. Like what, what you're saying essentially is I need to just start so that I can prove myself wrong and kind of gain a little bit of confidence and just, you know, again, be like, okay, I have started now. I feel like I have a pretty decent handle on this one thing. Now I feel like I could take on something else. What would that be? So yeah, Yeah. that's a great tip. I love that. Thanks so much again for your time today, Shelby. Isn't Shelby super sweet and super smart too? I hope you gained a lot out of there. I will say uh, it it really made a believer out of me that even someone like me w- with a total brown thumb, like things are possible. And I have had decent luck with tomatoes and peppers and a couple of herbs uh, since I talked with Uh, Shelby for the summit conversation that I just shared with you. So I hope that she makes you feel a little braver as well. So in the next episode of the Intentional Mom podcast, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be sharing my sticky note strategy with you. 
Uh, so if you're at all intrigued by that, you should be. Sticky notes. If you know me at all, you know that I am a big fan of sticky notes. So we'll jump in and talk about that in the next episode. We'll talk then. <laughs> 